half your soul is asleep. In dreams it is human. The other half is awake. In dreams it is God. Wed the two halves in ecstasy and you become who you really are. Each of us has a secret lover, a lover who's very near, a lover who is always with us, a lover who hovers just behind us in erotic images that flood our minds during sexual arousal or in sleep, a dream lover who masquerades as the individuals with whom we fall in love. An ideal lover who has adored us since the beginning of our existence. A divine lover who will never abandon us until the instant we both dissolve in ecstasy into the singularity, the supreme singularity of Godhead. For an eternal instant we feel the kiss of our secret lover in the ecstasy of orgasm and in moments of rapture when the when the beauty of music or dance or visual art or nature overcome us whenever we experience a broken heart it's often because another individual hasn't lived up to the perfection of our secret lover the reason sexual experiences are often better in the imagination or memory than in actuality is because it is in the imagination that the secret lover is nearest us. Personal relationships will always and ultimately be disappointing to us and because in truth there can never be a human relationship that matches the perfect one we already have with our secret lover. It's the secret standard by which all things are measured. The irony is that most of us are not aware of our relationship with our secret lover. Surrender to the secret lover is the central theme of most every religion, yet doctrines and practices of the world's so-called great religions work hard to dilute, deflect, and deter most of us from the genuine personal experience. Moreover, the great religion and the great religious establishments have unceasingly labored to convince their congregations that this most private of all spiritual events, events is not a personal experience at all, but a mystery that's not for us to explore. An ambiguous and incomprehensible episode, something that must be validated by a priestcraft, a priestcraft who will interpret it and then perhaps just perhaps allow us to participate vicariously with them in an approved pantomime of the of the sacred marriage to the secret lover it's especially ironic for those of us in the west that the mythical story of the life of christ exemplifies in word and deed the central secret of this divine relationship Many passages in the New Testament and recently discovered Gnostic, so-called Gnostic texts clearly reveal that the Christ is a projected image, not of a historical event, but of a level of consciousness that is attainable by each and every one of us. Try as they might, Western religions have found it impossible to completely obscure this most sacred mystery from the personal experiences of devoted individuals. The ecstasies of, of Rumi and Hafaz, of the nun Gertrude, St. Teresa, are unmistakable examples of a mystical sexual ecstasy, 
ecstatic surrender to the divine lover. It was only because of the influence and programming of their local religions and cultural environment that the image of their lover was that of Jesus, a pal Palestinian holy man. Had Teresa been a Hindu, her lover may have been Krishna or Vishnu or any number of deities of devotion. In fact, the Hindu yogis, and this is what I was talking about yesterday, the Hindu yogis have an entire system of self-realization based on the power of pure love and devotion. Bhakti Yoga Union with God through pure devotion. Now, if you're a devotee of a particular god or goddess of that particular system, the character and image of your devotion is already conveniently provided for you by mythology, artwork, and the doctrines of your religion. In some cultures, where the devotional character is particularly strong, the devotee transfers and projects the divine essence on the character of one's own teacher or guru. Loving the Guru is the, as the living incarnation of the uh, Supreme Consciousness. Like Paramahansa Yogananda viewed his Guru, Swami Sri Yukteswar. As Sri Yukteswar did for his Guru, Lahiri Mashai. And Lahiri Mashai did for his Guru, Mahavatar Babaji. But make no mistake about it. The supreme singularity of consciousness of the universe is so singular, so universal that no creed, no god form, no avatar or guru can possibly corner the market on this totality of consciousness. The singularity of Godhead is the singularity, no matter by what name you call it or in what form you imagine it. For the magician, and for those of us who do not, do not resonate to the forms and characters of the deities of established religions, for those of us who could just never allow ourselves to worship a guru or teacher as a living God, we can still succeed in finding within ourselves a concrete form for the formless and abstract totality of consciousness. We can find within ourselves a living symbol, an image we can hold in our minds and adore and unite with. We can still find within ourselves a visible vessel for the invisible deity. And that image is our holy guardian angel. And our holy guardian angel is a direct reflection of the singularity of Godhead. And we are the direct reflection of the holy guardian angel. According to the Chaldean oracles of Zoroaster, prior to any magical or theurgic uh, ritual, the magician must first invoke and become united with something called the Agathoth Daimon, or Good Spirit, or Noble Spirit. It's conceptualized as a personal guardian spirit or angel whose function as mediator between the magician and the gods. Socrates claimed to have what he called the Daimonion, which usually, loosely translates a divine something. The voice of his demonion, D-I-A-O-N-I-O-N, daimonion, which loosely translates a divine something. The voice of his demonion <laughs> never told him what to do, but it frequently warned him against mistakes. In Western Hermeticism, this spiritual lover is called the Holy Guardian Angel, or the Higher Genius, Adonai, or the Master Within, and ceremonial magicians 
have latched on to the term holy guardian angel. And our marriage to this spiritual being is called knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel. The term knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel first appeared in this context in which is arguably the most influential uh, magical text of all time, the book of Abramelin by Abramelin the Jew of Worms, a German alchemist who lived from 1362 to 1458. In the book he tells the tale of Abramelin, an Egyptian mage who after many ordeals taught him a supreme secret of magic and practical instructions to use to master and control all spirits, including those other magicians fear as being evil spirits. The great secret was that each of us is possessed with our own personal divine guardian angel, who in a sense is our soulmate, and in another sense is the other half of ourself. But at the moment, it doesn't do us any good to think of it as the other half of our self because our consciousness is vibrating on such a low frequency that from our current point of view, the Holy Guardian Angel really is an objective, separate being. But in fact, we're not fully ourselves until we have profoundly united with our Holy Guardian Angel. And what's more, the angel is not fully itself until it is united with you. In other words, the holy guardian angel needs you, or perhaps more, than you think you need the holy guardian angel. Once his marriage is complete, once you both, you and the angel, are a single unit, then and only then is the magician truly a magician. Possessed with the spiritual insight and integrity to wisely wield the powers of a magician. Until knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel has been achieved, the proto-magician is operating blindly in the dark and does not yet have the wisdom or discernment to know what is or is not in his or her best interest. This little tidbit of information is actually pretty big stuff. And in the late 19th century would blow the minds of the leaders and initiates of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, who realized this secret rescues the practice of Western ceremonial magic from a collection of superstitious and clumsy attempts at bargaining with demons and bribing angels <laughs> and elevates it to a science of self-transformation on par with the disciplines of yoga and the great mystical systems of the East. In 1888, a fragment, <laughs> a fragment of a copy of the book of Abramelin was uh, translated by Samuel Little McGregor Mathers and published as The Sacred Magic of Abramel and the Mage and immediately became a sensation among the initiates of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn who were quick to see that knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel was a level of consciousness which corresponds to the initiatory level of now, this is Kabbalah here, the, the initiatory level of Tifereth. Right there, number six on the Tree of Life. Okay. Uh, <laughs> on the Kabbalistic scale of consciousness known as the Tree of Life. Now it might seem the term holy guardian angel is a very unsatisfactory way to describe a shift in human consciousness or a level of awareness. But in many ways it's just perfect. 
When we hear the term Holy Guardian Angel, many of us immediately think of one of two things. Something sweet and warm and fuzzy, like Catholic children pray to the guardian angel. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here, ever this day, or if it's at night, ever this night, be at my side to light and guard, to rule and guide. Amen. And say what you, you want about um, uh, Catholicism and, and Catholic indoctrination. That is still a pretty good thing to uh, plant in a child's imagination, unlike most everything else attached, <laughs> attached to that that system. Okay, but that one, that's a pretty good idea, I think. Uh, well, you either think of that or you, uh, you think uh, you try to explain things by pointing out to a location somewhere on a chart like the Tree of Life, uh, which is a diagram which tries to map out our existences uh, and being as levels of consciousness from, from your head up at the uh, down at the bottom at 10 to Godhead up at number one. The singularity or the supreme intelligence. Using this map, existence as we normally perceive it, and the objective reality most of us identify with is way down in number 10, the slowest and most dense, slowest vibratory frequency of consciousness. Kabbalists call it the microcosm or the little world the manifest world of matter and energy, the world we call objective reality, and our everyday consciousness. Ancient Hermeticists tried to understand this phenomenal world as the interaction of five fundamental uh, el elements, fire, water, air, earth, and spirit. So they represented this, this uh, objective reality, uh, this microcosm by the figure of the pentagram or number five there. But if we could wake up even just a little bit, we would discover that just above and behind this microscopic world of space-time and all the microscopic furniture we stub our microcosmic toes on are seven unique layers of a different dimension. Okay, so that on a tree of life, our number five microcosm, could easily be attributed to there. And then the the macrocosm or the six levels above that would be that area right there on the on the tree. Let's see. Uh, a different spectrum of consciousness frequencies like that, like a rainbow of colors created when pure light is passed through a prism that shatters the pure light of Godhead and spreads them into the spectrum of des uh, descending levels of consciousness. These seven layers of consciousness the ancients attributed to the seven planetary spheres. Together they form what they called the macrocosm, the greater world, the higher dimensions of consciousness and reality represented by the hexagram, the six planetary spheres around the central uh, number six sun, which is often used to symbolize the sun uh, surrounded by the spheres Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Venus, Mercury, and Luna. It is our great work, indeed. It's our inescapable destiny to achieve perfect realization of and attunement with this level of consciousness. Christian mystics call it Christ consciousness, where the consciousness of the Father is perfectly reflected in the consciousness of the sun. 
Now I've uh, got this material out uh, today because later on this afternoon uh, I will be uh, interviewed and, and speaking in a at uh, at a thing about the the Holy Guardian Angel, and when uh, uh, when I find out what the link of that will uh, will be, I'll be sure to share that with you. I'll have more to say. Rambling on off the top of my head, which is this was the good stuff. Anyway, until tomorrow for Saturday morning cartoons. Continue to be good to yourself. Be good to each other. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will.